Park. Mr. Soros, uh, <coughs> as Stuart uh, mentioned, uh, your support of various progressive causes is well known, and I think by a number of us here in the room, uh, especially, uh, very much appreciate it. You mentioned global warming uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, I'm wondering if you uh, had uh, ever applied your uh, reflexivity theory in the area of uh, business and the environment. Um, for instance, uh, would you presume that or assume that our species, including the, the businesses that we've created, should develop a different kind of reflexive type relationship with the natural environment, especially when it comes to crises like global warming? Well, you know, I, I've become sort of converted to global warming relatively recently, and, and certainly Al Gore had a lot, lot to do with that. Uh, I mean, he really is, is uh, a very good teacher in that respect. Uh, um, it really it, it requires, I think, I mean, there is a school of thought that business will take care of it, actually. Uh, I, I was in Davos uh, listening to a presentation from various people who said, that, well, you know, uh, it's a problem that markets can actually uh, solve. I think it's a very dangerous uh, illusion. Um, British Petroleum uh, which happens to be one of the most enlightened companies in this respect. Uh, gave an example where you, know, you can take uh, carbon out of coal and re-inject it in the, in, the, in the oil field and thereby increase the pressure and, uh, it actually pays for itself. And, uh, and maybe there is a case where this can be done when a coal field happens to be close enough to an oil field. But as a, as a, as a general recipe uh, for dealing with global warming, it's, 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 it's not sustainable. So you do need, you do need government action. And uh, there is a, actually a lot of volunteerism now in this area, in this country, because the public recognizes the problem more than the administration. So you have action on by, by, uh, there's a voluntary uh, uh, exchange, uh, a carbon exchange, uh, and, and there are all kinds of regulations by states. But that's only because the federal government is failing in what it, what it needs uh, to do. And actually, one of the responses to the energy crisis has been to suspend the state regulations of various forms of gasoline in order to increase the, the production. It just shows you that having regulation at the state level is very inefficient. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just back from a meeting in Europe on global ethics. I wish you'd been there. It would have been interesting. And one of the things that came up, of course, was the destabilizing effects of ideologies including the U.S. anti-terrorist ideology. Um, so I'm at a disadvantage in that all I've been able to read is this one little paper. I wish I'd been able to read the whole thing. Um, and um, this a publication of yours you may be know about. In any case, um, it struck me, I was very excited by it. It struck me that you were thinking along lines that um, some of us have been trying to think here we have a program in what we call the human sciences, which is distinct from the social sciences and distinct from the humanities. Um, and I could go on about that a long time, but I won't for the moment. I just want to come back to something you said earlier on about uh, the fact that you knew and were influenced by Popper to some extent. Um, because one of the things that seemed to me always to be um, doubtful about Popper was his introduction of what he called World 3, the, the um, domain of objective knowledge. Um, and it struck me that what you're doing really is um, contend. I, I, I mean, I think we would agree here, but I'm not sure. We might contend ourselves with what he called world one and two. There's the natural world, and there's, there's the world of 
put it briefly, mine, but what individuals think and, and what individual agents think and, and the degree of their knowledge and the degree of their imagination, which is where the reflexivity comes in. So I wonder if, uh, if, you, uh, if you have nothing to say about it, that's fine. But what did you think of Popper's tendency to objectify what one might call human entities yeah. in World 3? Yeah, it's very interesting that you should bring that up because that's where I lost it him. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really did. And, and actually, I really, you know, when it came to World 3, I thought he, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, so it's the earlier prop, proper uh, uh, you know, that that has really shaped my thinking. But I think you have sit, sitting next to you one of the uh, uh, best uh, uh, proper proper <laughs> proper archaeologists, uh, uh, and so. It, Give me a rest, actually, if you, if you <laughs> commented and defended me okay. uh, the but world three. But then I want to say something else. <laughs> okay. But, but I, I think that world three is not not very mysterious at all. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's mysterious. It's not Plato. It's not Plato's world three. But if you think about what exists, you have to recognize the existence of human artifacts mm -hmm. and artifacts, um, things that we create things that we produce, and among the things that we produce and create are um, linguistic descriptions of, of the thought processes that we have in our minds. Uh, of course, we create other things as well, like nations, like states, mm -hmm. and what types of things are these? Well, it's hard to think about them as being material objects. It's also hard to think about them as being mental entities. So if you were to say, I mean, if you just begin there and say, Without any any worries about epistemological questions mm -hmm. or metaphysical, you just say, what kind of things are there? Where would these artifacts belong? Where would numbers belong? Uh, where where would statements belong? Um, they seem to have an autonomy once they're produced that we don't quite associate with mental entities, world two objects. But nor do they seem to be obvious to material. Right. Um, I don't know whether this should turn into a seminar on, on Popper's World 3. Um, but I think that it's unnecessary to invoke a separate ontology for these things. Because what you have is human subjects, who are, of course, physical, and whatever they do runs on a neurophysiological platform of some kind, um, who uh, produce what the phenomenologists call intentional objects. Um, and the objects that you're speaking of are, are what I call co-intentional objects, and they're co-intentional because um, the criterion, if we want to agree about them, is not that we look in the world, which would be the case with natural objects, but we talk to one another. And it turns out that I have the same view of, let's say, um, uh, ideologies that you do. And after a long process of what I call mutual instruction and the mutual criticism, um, we have um, each of us as a complete set, as it were, of these things. So you don't need another place to put them. That's, that's my objection to all three. It's as though there were a third ontology. Um, well, um, we can talk about yeah, we can. I don't even. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, but the reason I part of company is, is uh, because, according to my view of reflexivity, I, I don't distinguish between world one and world two. I mean, to me, it's there's a two-way connection between them that really ties them pretty closely together. So so that's why I didn't see any need for a world three to, in order to have a clear separation between world one and world two, when in reality there is no separation. So that's where I, that's why I parted company with, with Now we have three different I, I encountered tremendous problems in trying to describe what I had in mind uh, talking about reflexivity. 